take out your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel. Now, we're starting a new book this morning. To find it, it's a little bit hard. Open up your Bible to the middle. Go slightly to the right. If you find Ezekiel, you're close. Just keep going to the right. It's right to the right of the book of Ezekiel. You'll find Daniel there. We're going to look at chapter 1, verses 1 to 7 this morning. So when you find that, let's go ahead and stand up together for the reading of God's holy word. Here at Gospel Fellowship, we believe that God's Word is inspired, and it is inerrance, and it is the infallible Word of the true and the living God. So we are in Daniel, again, chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. Listen carefully now to the Word of the Lord. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. And then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, verse 4, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah, And the chief of the eunuchs gave them the names, Daniel, he called Balthashazar, Hananiah, he called Shadrach, Mishael, he called Meshach, and Azariah, he called Abednego. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. All right, Gospel Fellowship, you are... uh, You're walking into the first day of class. If you're new, if you're visiting, you came in on a good day because we're just starting something new today. Uh, It's the first day of a new semester for us. We just spent 70 plus weeks in the book of Revelation. We're about to start 31 weeks now in the book of Daniel is going to be our new study. And so today's uh, message is going to come across a little bit as a lecture here at the beginning In fact, there's going to be a moment where I take off the brown corduroy jacket of the lecturer, the professor, and I'll put on the Geneva black uh, gown of the preacher, and I'll let you know when I'm going to do that. So uh, for the most part, this message is going to come across as something of a professorial lecture because we have a lot of backgrounds to capture here. This is a hard book, I'm going to be honest. Uh, The first half of the book of Daniel is a rather easy book to understand. It's filled with narrative and stories that you learned as a child. Some of you probably already know the main points of the book of Daniel, but the second half of the book is far more complicated than that, and so it becomes us today to spend a little bit of time, quite a bit of time, in fact, to capture what is happening here in terms of the historical context of the book. I need you to know something of the literary genre of the book. I need you to know something of the background setting, the style, all those things we're going to work on today. And so again, this is going to come across a little bit professorial here. I would love it. I'd be honored if you would regularly bring a notebook and a pen to Gospel Fellowship when you come to our sermons because our goal is simply to teach through expository style the Word of God chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph, verse by verse. That's what we do here at Gospel Fellowship. And so it'd be good for you to take some notes. You might want to take a special notes this morning as we're laying the, fa- the foundation for where we're going to be headed in this particular book. So what I'd like to do this morning is to cover the basics of where we're going to be going here for the next 31 weeks. First, we are going to look at the author and the time of the composition of this book, the book of Daniel. So a lot of background information is going to come heavy to you at the beginning of the sermon. Second of all, we are going to say something about the historical context of the time in which this book uh, took place, namely the exile, a major significant event in your Old Testament. And then third, we're going to look at uh, basically the main characters and the plots of this particular book, which again, you're going to need to be familiar with for the book to even make sense at all. Towards the end, again, I will switch from professor mode into preacher mode. And I'll have a couple of applications for you before we end up going here together to the Lord's Supper as a Bible-believing church. All right, so Bibles are out. Let's talk, first of all, about the author and the date 
of the book of Daniel. Crucial, crucial information right out of the top here. Look at verse 1 of chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So there's the historical context right here. The third year of the reign of Jehoiakim is 605 BC, 605 years before Christ. So that's our basic uh, first stone we're going to set here for this book. The author of the book of Daniel is, in fact, Daniel. No surprise there. It's written in bold letters at the top of the page, right? Daniel is the author. Now, some people actually don't believe that. And that's the position we're going to call the liberal position today. We're not slinging around name calling here or anything like that. It's just that there are some who disagree with that. Now, we believe that Daniel was written by Daniel. And the the reason we believe that, quite honestly, is that Daniel says that at least six times in the book of Daniel. He says the phrase, I, Daniel. And so Daniel is giving you every possible indication that he's the author. He says, I, Daniel, in 8.15, and 8.27, and 9.2, and 10.2, 10.7, and 12.5, at least those indicators, okay? Daniel is the author of the book of Daniel. If you have any doubt about that, if there should be any doubt left, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, says that Daniel is the author of the book of Daniel. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus cites Daniel as the author of this prophecy. So for us who are conservative, Bible-believing Christians, there really is no particular controversy about the authorship of the book. Uh, Daniel says it is, Jesus says it is, so that's what we're going to assume as a matter of course in our study as we work through this book for the next 30 plus weeks or so. Now I should mention this as well, that the dating of the book of Daniel is also highly significant, especially to those of us with high view of Scripture, conservative starting point presuppositions, okay? So again, let me give you a little bit of background here. If the beginning of the book is 605 B.C., because it just said so in chapter 1, verse 1, the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim, okay? The book takes place roughly over about 70 years of history, the 70 years of the exile, And Daniel is the main character, and he's going to live through all of these events all the way down to something like the 530s BC, at which point Babylon ceases to be the world dominion power of the day, and Persia takes over. Daniel lives through all of these events all the way down to the 530s or so. And so Daniel is writing essentially from a first-person perspective here, and I want you to notice If you look at your Bible with me, look at verse 4 of our text today. Daniel here and the others are called youths without blemish. In other words, young people. Daniel was probably just a teenager at the beginning stages of this book. And that includes some very important sections here at the beginning of the book. Daniel is just a teenager. If you look around the room this morning, there's probably a few teenagers sitting around you. That might help you if you're thinking that Daniel is some sort of a strong, heroic warrior. He's not, especially at the beginning of the book. He's just a very, very young man, possibly even what we might call a boy. Daniel is a youth here at the beginning of this text. Now, the reason I'm stressing the date of the uh, composition of this book is because the dating of this book is actually a theological matter, and I'll tell you why. All right? Now, um, whether we're going to be conservatives and date this book in the uh, sixth, sixth century BC, as Bible believing scholars would, or whether we're going to take the liberal position and assume that Daniel was actually written much later than that, maybe something like 175 BC, uh, however we determine the date of the composition of this book, it is a theological matter. And here, this is exactly why, okay? So some books of the Bible. Like, quite honestly, it, it really doesn't matter what the date is because the, the message of the book doesn't change. For instance, the book of Job is a book that we really don't have a lot of background historical context. Uh, we think it's very old, probably one of the oldest books in the Bible, but, but we don't have a fixed century in which we can say this is when the book of Job must take place in order to be coherent as a theological message. Uh, we might be off by a couple hundred years about the book of Job, and it really doesn't change the overall theological point of that particular book. We just came off a long series in Revelation in which we very often batted back and forth whether we thought Revelation was written in about 68 or 69 AD, or 
whether Revelation was written something like 95 AD. In fact, uh, it didn't matter so much that after 70 sermons, I, at least myself, I still wasn't decided whether I liked the 68 AD or the 95 AD. Uh, it didn't really matter too much in terms of our theological interpretation of this book. So too with uh, Gospels like Matthew, whether Matthew wrote in the 50s or the 60s, AD, doesn't really matter. But this book significantly matters, whether we will select the earlier date or the later date. And, and again, here's why. Because uh, if, as I'm going to hold in my series here, excuse me, get some water. If it's, if it's, as I'm going to hold in the series here, it's the 6th century B.C., then that means that the things that Daniel tells us about the nations that he's describing here in this book, as they do come true in redemption history, then that means that Daniel has been speaking from a position of future predictive prophecy, right? So if Daniel is writing before these events take place in world history, then clearly he must be a true prophet with Holy Spirit inspiration in order to see these things and to describe them in some detail before they actually come about in real history. Okay? On the other hand, if Daniel is written at that later date of 175 BC, then Daniel is only describing things that have already transpired. They've already taken place. And what that means is that the book of Daniel is essentially a fraud. It would be a fraudulent document that portends to be future predict predictive prophecy, and yet, if he's actually writing after the fact, then it is not necessarily inspired or supernatural at all. Okay? So I'm telling you, and I'm holding that, our dating of this book in the 6th century B.C. is a theological predisposition on my part because I have a high view of Scripture, I'm assuming that when Daniel predicts these things by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is doing so through the supernatural work of biblical future predictive prophecy. He is not describing these things after the fact, as the liberal scholars would say. And again, I'm not using that term as an insult. We're just establishing our categories here. So what kinds of supernatural future predictive prophecies are contained in this book that demand our recognition of an early dating of this book? Well, let me give you three, but there's actually going to be a lot of them coming throughout our study. First, Daniel tells us about the major changing hands of the kingdoms of which our dominion, the main ruling powers of the age. He's going to predict four successive turnovers of the world dominative powers throughout those times, okay? So in chapter 2 and in chapter 7, those two chapters, Daniel is going to describe what we now know to be the changing hands of world power from Babylon to Persia and then to Greece and then finally to Rome, okay? If Daniel's writing at a later date, he's merely describing the past. If he's writing at an early date, he predicted those things by the supernatural help of the Holy Spirit. Completely different perspective, whether you take the early date or the late date. Okay. Second major predictive prophecy. Daniel gives us a prophecy about Alexander the Great. You remember him from history class, right? World history class, Alexander the Great. He's the great Greek who dominated the entire known world at that time. Daniel gives us future predictive prophecies that pin the tail on Alexander the Great without any doubt. And either he did that foreseeing it by the help of the Holy Spirit, or else he is a fraud describing something that already took place. And again, that really, really matters how we interpret this book. Next one, and this is probably the most important of all. Daniel has several very significant prophecies about the kingdom of God. In other words, the coming of Christ. There are highly significant prophecies in this book that give us some matter of detail about the very timing of the coming of Christ into the world. If Daniel is right, and he's seeing this as future predictive prophecy, then the kingdom of God begins to emerge sometime during that fourth kingdom, which is the kingdom of Rome. And friends, that's exactly what happens. Of course, you know that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ takes place 
out of the midst of the context of the empire of Rome. If he's right about that, it's by the help of the Spirit. Okay? Otherwise, he's writing as a fraudulent writer sometime later. Okay? So again, highly significant here, even to the dating of the book. Now let's shift gears here and let's talk about the historical context of this book because this does very, very much matter in our interpretation of how we're going to proceed here. So look at verse 2. Now let me describe the background here to you a little bit this morning. Verse 2 says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his, that is Nebuchadnezzar's, hands with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Okay, so, all right, what are we dealing with? Well, this is a book about the exile. If you're not familiar with the exile, you have to catch up quick, okay? Because the exile is one of the most significant events that takes place in your Old Testament, in the Bible, around which many, many Old Testament books actually points. Okay, this is a major significant event. Well, what happened? Well, uh, Babylon came and they attacked the nation of Israel, specifically Judah, the southern kingdom, and they dragged the Israelites out of the promised land and brought them to Babylon in a period that we now call the captivity or the exile. That's a historical fact. Nobody debates that. And the exile took place over a series of various attacks. Okay? In 722 BC, the nation of Assyria attacked the northern kingdom of Israel. And later on, more than a hundred years later, Babylon, the next world power after Assyria, came and dragged out her people in a series of waves that we call the exile. 605 BC, they came and they dragged Israelites out of the promised land and into Babylon. Again in 597 BC, they came and they dragged more Israelites into Babylon. Again, in 586 B.C., Babylon came and they attacked one more time, sieging Jerusalem, dragging faithful Israelites out. Three waves of captivity that takes place. Now, if you're not familiar with the exile, okay, then a lot of the Old Testament is going to be somewhat vague to you because we actually have a number of Old Testament books that describe the exile. Okay, So 2 Kings is a book that tells of the spiritual downfall of the people of God and how they are taken into captivity. The book of 2 Chronicles, likewise very parallel to 2 Kings, tells the story again of the spiritual fall and decline of the nation of Israel and Judah, how the kings turned apostate and how God brought the curse that he'd been promising them. God had been warning them that if you're unfaithful, if you apostatize, if you turn away from the faith aggressors will come and they will drag you into captivity and into slavery. And that's exactly what happened. Okay? So we also have books like Jeremiah. We have books like Ezekiel. We have the book of Daniel, our book. We have Lamentations. All of these Old Testament books are centered around this terrible period in which God's people were conquered, again, first by Assyria and then by Babylon, culminating in, essentially, the destruction and the captivity of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. We call this period the exile. Okay? Now, spiritually, spiritually speaking here, you say, well, who cares about that? It's just a bunch of history, right? No, it's not. It's not just a bunch of history because God had been warning His people of the consequences of spiritual adultery against Him as the covenant Lord. God had been warning his people for generations and even centuries, all the way back to the time of Moses. He warned the people in Deuteronomy 28, if you turn away from the true and living God, if you turn away from covenant faithfulness, I will send hostile nations and they will pull you into slavery again. You came out of slavery in Egypt, right? You will go back to slavery if you turn unfaithful to me. That is a warning that God gave his people. And yes, God... Uh, He stayed his hand multiple times because of his mercy. God stayed his hand of judgment multiple times because of his clemency. But finally, when the people of God, when they do not repent, when when they do not turn back, when they are not faithful, and this may be relevant to us, when we are not faithful to the living God, he will send judgment upon the land. 
And yet, there is also in all of these exile writings, all of the prophetic writings, there's this golden thread woven all the way through it that God will preserve his remnant people faithful despite all of the sufferings that they are going to go through. Okay? So Daniel is one of the exiles that has to experience this deportation to Babylon. He has to experience the hardship and the suffering of his own people being conquered. And yet he is going to often promise not only the preservation of the remnant people of God, okay, but he's also going to have glimpses of the glorious messianic age that is to come. And he's going to share that to us and for us in a number of ways throughout our study in this book, okay? So the context is the exile. Please do a little bit of background research about the exile uh, for your own private study this week. It will help you to understand this book as we proceed. Third, um, we need to know something of the main characters of this book. And so let's look now at verse 6 in today's reading, okay? Chapter 1, verse 6. Now, here's a bunch of names, but don't blink out here because these are important. There's a theological thing happening here that I want you to see. Okay, verse 6. Among these, so that is to say, among those who were deported, these youths without blemish that are being described here, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah, And verse 7, the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Balteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he calls Abednego. So again, uh, these are probably just youths or even teenagers that we're talking about here. Now let me describe. So, And you can read some of the vicious details of the exile in other books. Jeremiah has some detailed details. Uh, descriptions of what happens. The book of Lamentations in poetic form is a somewhat of a horrible book to read. There are some glimmers of hope there, but it's a lot of struggle for the people of God. When Babylon came, here's what they did. Uh, those men who were of fighting age, they killed. Okay? Those women who were beautiful, they took as captive slave brides for themselves. Uh, Those who were the abject poor, they simply left them in the land to fend for themselves. And some of the young people who were were old enough to be intelligent, but young enough to be re-educatable, they took as these youths who they're essentially going to brainwash with Babylonian ideology. You tracking with me on that? So they kill the people that are strong enough to fight back. They take the beautiful of the women for themselves to rape or to marry or to pillage or whatever else they're going to do with the beautiful women. The poor they leave to fend for themselves for the land, but the young people, mark this, they take for the purpose of cultural and theological re-education. This is very significant, and Daniel is one of those thought to be re-educatable under the brainwashing regime of the Babylonian uh, empire here. Now, here's what we probably just miss when we glance over this name list in verses 6 and 7. There's, again, something very theological happening here. Please pay attention to this. Each one of their names is originally a Hebrew name that has a particular theological import to it. Okay, In other words, each of their Hebrew names expressly glorify Jehovah God or Yahweh God or the God of the Bible. Okay, their names are essentially praises, but here's what happens. When the Babylonians capture these young men, the very first thing they do is they strip them of their God-glorifying Hebrew names and instead they give them pagan Babylonian names. Okay? The first part of your re-education is that you're not who you thought you were anymore. We're going to tell you who you are. We're going to tell you who you worship. We're going to tell you what your cultural and intellectual priorities are going to be. Okay, so, so listen to this very carefully. So Daniel, the name Daniel, literally in the Hebrew means God is judge. Okay, And yet he is given a new name, Balteshazzar, which is interesting because he will now be named after a female deity. Okay, 
So not only is Daniel going to be given the pagan name of a female deity, but there's something of an emasculating or demasculating quality of his new name. Okay? No longer will you worship the God of Israel, the strong, mighty God who's described in the Old Testament, but now we are going to place you as a unwilling to become a willing servant, hopefully after the female goddess or the feminine form of deity here. That's a, that's a way of demasculizing Daniel and re-theologizing his life significance. You see what they did to him there? Okay. Capturing the minds and the hearts of the youth is what they're trying to do here. Hananiah, his name means Yahweh is gracious. That's a name that you want to hold on to because you're going to trust the graciousness of God even in times of despair and captivity. But no, you're going to be given a new name, not Yahweh is gracious. Your new name is going to be Shadrach, which literally means I fear Aku, the moon god. That's what your name is going to be. Okay, forget about the fact that your God is gracious. You are now going to fear Aku, the moon god. That's your new name. Okay, and so too with Mishael. Mishael literally means who is like God, and yet your new name will be Meshach, meaning who is like Aku, the moon god. And as for Azariah, whose name is Yahweh is my helper, your new name, we're going to just give you a new name here. Let's, let's call you Abednego, which means servant of Nego, another pagan Babylonian god. So in each case, in each instance, their beautiful, true, God-exalting name is going to be stripped off of them, and they're going to be renamed with pagan Babylonian deities, feminine or otherwise. They're going to be, they're going to be reassigned new names. Now, I think you might even be thinking to yourself here, okay, well, that's kind of relevant, isn't it? Because if you want to take a generation captive, what you do is you, you take the young people that are educatable and you strip them of their prior setting, their prior convictions, their prior priorities, their worldview. You want to, you want to strip them of that and then you want to refill their minds and their hearts with other information that is going to be counter to what they grew up learning, trusting, and believing. Okay, So even in their names here, we see that. Now, uh, let, let me give you a couple of interesting facts about the book of Daniel, then I'm going to switch from lecturer to preacher if I haven't done that already. A couple of interesting facts here. First, um, as for the outline of the book of Daniel, if you're looking to outline the book, there's two ways to do this. You might say that the easiest way to outline the book is to simply say that chapters 1 through 6 are narrative, and chapter 7 through 12 are visionary prophecy. Those will be the harder chapters for us to discuss because they are quite complicated. Okay? So that's probably the easiest way to divide it. Chapters 1 to 6 are Bible stories. You're going to know them. Chapters 7 through 12 are going to be the future visionary prophecies that we're going to have to really do a lot of work to understand. Okay? There's another way to outline the book, and it's very natural if we were to look at the biblical languages here. Daniel is the only book in the entire Bible that has the distinction of being written primarily in two different languages. Daniel is the only book that is written in Hebrew and a large section of Aramaic. Now, we're not exactly sure why he did this because the division isn't clean necessarily, but the Hebrew of the book is chapters 1 through chapter 2, verse 4. That's Hebrew. And then the large middle portion of the book, 2, 5, all the way through the end of 8 is in Aramaic. And then he's, I'm sorry, end of 7 is Aramaic. And then he switches over to Hebrew again for reasons that are not entirely understood by by scholars or theologians. So we may try to puzzle about that as we go on. The other thing I want to say here. Um, just in, by way of introduction, is that the reason that we're doing Daniel now is because Daniel has a great amount of uh, conceptual overlap with the book of Revelation, which we just finished. And the reason is because they share a literary style, the style of apocalyptic genre. So apocalyptic, as you know, uh, because we studied Revelation, is that style of literature in which you have dynamic descriptions you have visions, you have angels, you have beasts, you have somewhat hard to discern prophecies. And so Daniel and Revelation, they actually share quite a bit of literary style. And not only that, but both of them are moored by a great triumphant vision of Christ, especially at his ascension, 
So specifically, Revelation 5 is a, is a glorious picture of Christ who has ascended to the right hand of the Father. So also is Daniel chapter 7, another beautiful description of Jesus Christ and his ascended glory sitting at the right hand of the Father. So we'll get there when we get there, all right? So that's my introduction. Now, let me switch to preacher mode here, if I haven't already, and just make two applications before we go to the Lord's table today. First application in the form of a question. To which culture will you be assimilated? Okay. You are being assimilated, just like the youths here, aren't you? Aren't we, I should say. Yes, we are feeling that tension every day. In fact, look with me at verses 3 and 4. And let's just think about the fact of um, what is happening here is essentially a re-education camp in the midst of captivity in Babylon. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding and learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to, here we go, teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Now pause right there and I want you to think about yourself for just a moment. To which culture, I ask again, will you be assimilated? You say, I'm not being assimilated at all. Oh yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. Uh, And there are really only two options here. You are being assimilated to think and act and believe as an unbeliever on one hand, or you are being assimilated to understand, to think, to live your life, to believe as a Bible-believing Christian. And those are the only two options. In one sense, we might describe it like this. There are two catechisms that are warring for your mind. There is the catechism of the unbelieving world on one hand, and there is the catechism of the divine kingdom on the other hand. And every single day, what is happening to you? What is happening to your mind? You are being more and more assimilated into one or the other of those two ideologies. Are you aware of that? It's true. Think about how much information you are processing on a daily basis. Think about how much reading you are doing on a daily basis. Think about how much social media you are taking in on a daily basis. Think about the kinds and sources of information that you are running through your mind every single day on a daily basis. What is happening to you is simply this. Your mind, your life, your heart is being catechized by one or the other of those two catechisms, either, again, of the unbelieving world or of Bible-believing Christian doctrine. Now, you say to yourself, now, hold on a second. I'm not sure that I'm in either one of those camps. I'm a free thinker. I am one who considers myself objective in my thoughts. I am one who does not consider myself necessarily pulled in either polarity. I would simply tell you this, that if you believe that you are a free thinker who is not heavily influenced by one of those two catechisms, then you are already far more assimilated into the secular worldview than you actually think you are. If you don't recognize that it's happening, it's because you're not even aware of it, and you should be. So to which culture will you be assimilated. Well, I'm hoping that everything we do here at Gospel Fellowship is to pull you by God's grace into a fully Christian worldview in terms of your thinking, your grounding, your standing, your life, your worship, everything. That's what we want. We want to resist at every turn this almost relentless pull to be enculturated into the unbelieving Babylon secularism of our day. Second question, before which king will you stand? Okay, Because look at verse 5. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. These were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before 
the king. Now, which king, which king is in context here in verse 5? Which king are we talking about? Nebuchadnezzar himself. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar himself, as the Babylonian pagan king, he himself is going to evaluate exactly how successful this re-education program has been. And all of these young youths, including Daniel and Azariah and Mishael, And Hananiah, they're going to be, with the others, brought before the king for the king's own discernment and judgment on just how well they have been assimilated. Okay, And what will happen to them? What will happen to them? Well, um, if the program is entirely unsuccessful, I have no doubt that they'll be killed. You're going to see the fiery furnace heated up a little bit later in the book. Okay. If the re-education program is not entirely successful, they will be rejected for any position of prominence or influence in the Babylonian kingdom. They will not have any role of influence or leadership there if they don't imbibe fully in the worldview of the Babylonians. And uh, if the program is deemed marginally successful but not entirely successful, I have no doubt that they will simply be sent back for more years of re-education. Okay? Because at the end of the story, at the end of the day, they're going to stand before the king himself who is going to give an assessment of their thinking and their lives. So where do we go with that, believers? Well, there's another king that we need to be aware of, yes? There is an approval far more significant than the approval of the powers that be in this day and age. The one king that we must stand before church is the Lord God himself. And if that means, as we're going to see in the next chapter when we come together again, that we need to reject the fair of what the world offers us, then we will have to live and die by the consequences of that decision. And we'll say more about that next week when we gather together again.